Does God exist? Nothing's more important than God or no God. I know I shall never have the answer, yet I know I shall never stop asking the question. Why do I bother myself? Because maybe, just maybe, progress can be made. Start with the concept God. What does God mean? Is my image of God your image of God? Is God, if there is a God, the God of Judaism, Christianity, and Islam? Whatever their differences, a supreme being who is personal, conscious, and involved. Some philosophers reject such a God. Their concepts of God differ radically, so radically that God becomes an alternative God. Why seek an alternative God? I'm Robert Lawrence Kuhn, and Closer to Truth is my journey to find out. If I wonder about God, I must consider alternative gods. I read philosophers of all persuasions, study their arguments, learn a great deal, enjoy the process. But progress I do not make. Perhaps my pursuit should be more personal. So I go to England, to the University of Birmingham, to attend a workshop on alternative concepts of God. Oblivious to England's wind and rain, I engage the philosophers. I begin with a professor of metaphysics and religion known for his agnosticism, Robin Le Poitvin. We're at this conference on alternative concepts of God, and it's like being in a blizzard with all of these different ways of modifying God. What are some of the concepts, and, and how do you see them? Well, to define alternative concepts of, of God, we need to know what they're alternatives to. So let's start with what we might fairly represent as a, an orthodox mm -hmm. conception of God, that is, uh, God as the most perfect being uh, conceivable, a person who is omnipotent, uh, omniscient, and perfectly good, and so on and so forth. And you started with a person, which is important. Absolutely, absolutely. So alternative conceptions of God are going to modify one or other elements of those. So we might keep the person bit constant and modify the properties. So perhaps we haven't got an omnipotent God, but extremely powerful one, someone who might be constrained by their own moral nature. Maybe not, not an omniscient God, uh, maybe one who doesn't know the future, as we, we don't know the, know the future. Uh, more radically, you might seek to modify the person bit. You might think that God as a person is really just another being like us, and that doesn't seem quite all-pervasive or, or significant enough. So instead of thinking of God uh, as a person, you might identify God with the whole of, of nature. in some pantheism. pantheism yeah. we're, we're, and that's the pantheist uh, notion. Now, uh, some of these really, alternative yeah. concepts hope to make the, the, the concept of God more consistent. Granted, you have to give up God's transcendence or God as a person, but at least you have something more coherent. I think it would be true to say that, 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 that what's motivating some of these alternative uh, conceptions of, of God is, is the need uh, to, to have uh, a God that's going to provide the kind of religious role that we want God to play. God should be uh, all-pervasive. Uh, he should be around us um, and be absolutely the ground of, of existence in a way that a mere person mm -hmm. could not be. If we think of uh, uh, the God hypothesis, God, God exists, as being made true by some disjunction of, 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 of a possible truths, you know, either there is a person as That's traditionally right, conceived, right. or uh, we identify God with, with the universe in some sense, or right. with right, right, a, right, a, right, an ethical right, cause, right, right. then I'm probably going to be happy to sign up to it in, in that way. The, the, the trouble is that the disjunction can get a little bit too wide. And one needs to focus one's own thoughts insofar as those thoughts are going to inform a truly religious uh, attitude on, on one particular conception. 
This God-seeking process, a sort of scientific method to assess God, seems to make sense. First, spell out God's supposed traits. Then, vary one or more of these traits and analyze what happens. Does the concept of God become more coherent or more fantastic? It's not that I want the lowest common denominator, easy to accept God. Inventing new gods is not for me. Like it or not, I want only what's real. So can the traditional God be, well, improved? But even so, would an improved God be improved enough? How to vary conceptions of the divine? I meet the co-director of the Alternative God Workshop, philosopher Andre Bukharev. One way of thinking about the debate in the philosophy of religion is in terms of uh, the way people are thinking about the conceptual landscape in the philosophy of mind. So in the philosophy of mind, you have people who will say the mind is something completely different from the brain, right? So substance dualists. And on the other hand, people you have who believe those, in an immortal soul. Right, in an immortal soul. And then you'll have people who will say the brain is it and that's all. All this talk about the mind is we can dispense with that. And then you've got a range of views in between. And I think something similar is true in the philosophy of religion. What you've had in the past was really you had traditional theists on the one hand who argue that God is this holy transcendent being who created the universe, who is omniscient, omnipotent, and personal. so on. Personal. And, and who's an agent at that. That conception of God over here, or nothing, right? Mm -hmm. And that, that's, that's sort Just of Just a pure that, physical, naturalistic world. That's it. That's, that's all it. you got. Right. Nothing more. I've been dissatisfied with thinking of the uh, options when we think about the conceptions of the divine as being limited to just this divine, holy other creator being and nothing. And so why not explore some of the options in between? Give me a sense specifically of, of, of the spectrum. Once you get away from traditional theism as we've characterized it, you've got panentheism and then you've got pantheism. And I like to think of the various options as falling broadly underneath one of those two categories. The most prominent panentheists were process theists who endorsed the idea that God has a transcendent side and God has an imminent side. And that imminent side ends up being God's body and that's the world, that's the universe. Imminent side means God's totally invested in it and very, very close. And, and it's a part of God. Right. You've got, in, in other words, what you've got is you've got the universe as God's body, but God does have a sort of supernatural side on this kind of picture. God does have a supernatural side. There's something side kind beyond of the universe that exactly. is God. Yes. In panentheism. Notice, that's what's really going to be important about panentheism. Panentheists will never identify God with the universe. You get versions of panentheism that are naturalistic. And in this case, what you have is you have panentheists who are going to endorse uh, naturalism. The naturalistic panentheist sounds, at least superficially, contradictory because if you're a naturalist, the pan end, the end addition yes. means there's something of God beyond, beyond the right. universe. If it's beyond, uh, how could it be naturalistic? Right. I mean, they, they, they fight each other. I mean, and I don't think this is just a semantic quibble. I really think that people who are endorsing these sorts of views, and on both sides, both the pantheists and the panentheists, who are sort of having this border uh, war, war. <laughs> <laughs> they, they really need to clarify the boundaries here. Okay. So where do you come out in all this? Um, I think I may be involved in the border dispute. <laughs> Because you have some pantheists who want to say God is identical with the universe, but describing God or the divine as personal is a mistake. Using any sort of conventional religious language, no, 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 don't, don't do any of that. Mm. In fact, pantheism is a game changer completely, mm. right? In, fa in fact, what it, what it ends up being is, is it ends up being an alternative to the sort of, you know, traditional options that you find out there in terms of the religious landscape, sure, right? So right. you've got Judaism, Christianity, Islam, pantheism over here, yeah. right? So I think that a version of pantheism needs to get worked out that can fit within 
the uh, Judeo-Christian Islamic religious traditions. And why? Why? Why do, you, why do you want to do that? Why do I want to do that? Yeah, that's a good question. Well, in part because I'm a Christian. <laughs> <laughs> Well, that seems contradictory. <laughs> I hope not. And I, I, I'm not alone in this. There, there is a, there's that doesn't a make it uncontradictory. No, it does not. But it, there is a longstanding tradition, though, within Christian theology uh, among liberal Christians where people have been trying to do this kind of thing and making some sense out of uh, the divine that doesn't force them to sort of leave their understanding of the universe, if you will, at the door as soon as they enter into, let's say, you know, a church or a synagogue or a mosque. Mm. If you look at early Christianity and also Judaism, for instance, in the early medieval period, both traditions, as well as Islam when it emerged, they took philosophy very seriously. They took discoveries in the sciences very seriously. And similarly, I think we ought to be doing the same thing today. And that's why I think we ought to be considering pantheism as an option. Melding a monotheistic God with a pantheistic universe seems contradictory. In the former, God is personal and separate from the universe. In the latter, not personal and identical to the universe. Like oil and water, you can stir, but can it mix? I don't see how. How else to vary the traditional God? One classical divine trait is that God, being perfect, does not change. Can changeless be challenged? As it happens, the leading proponent of what is called developmental theism is at the workshop. Australian philosopher Peter Forrest. God, develop, what could that mean? Developmental theism, what I do there is I offer a, an account of, which is meant to reconcile the God of the philosophers with the God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. And it's based upon the idea that God changes. My idea is you start off with a God that is simply knows all the possibilities, so a God of knowledge and power, a God without any kind of personality or moral character who just chooses. And God could just have stayed that way, and that would be the God of the philosophers. But among the choices God can make, according to my speculation, is that God can choose to become something different. Is this God uh, a, uh, a, a consciousness or a conscious being? Uh, is it a person? You said it doesn't have a personality and there's no moral um, quality to it. There's, there's power and possibilities. Well, there's awareness. Okay, um, okay, that's fair. There's, awareness. A, there's awareness. There's awareness of the possibilities. We want to keep our hypothesis about this being as simple as we can sure. for obvious intellectual reasons, which is why I want to leave out any kind of moral character at this stage. Now... How do you choose without moral character? Well, you haven't got any limitations. So I claim that if you make a purely rational choice, you will choose what is good, but good in a kind of cold, objective way. You will just maximize the utility. And this is not a very nice sort of God. And this is not the sort of God of religion. And it's not a God whom I'd be prepared to worship. Now, my... You're not worshiping it because it doesn't have a moral character to it or, or it's not looking after you? Why aren't you worshiping it? Well, my idea of worship is you involves trust. And you wouldn't trust this sort of God. You don't know what he's going to do or it's going to do. He could lie to you, for example. But there's nothing to stop this kind of utilitarian God setting up various sorts of revelations, thinking, well, they're these human beings, and at this particular time in history, I think... Uh, I, I like this guy already. <laughs> uh, this would be a, uh, a good way for them to behave. I'll give them this whole lot of nonsense, but it'll make them behave better. And, yeah, it's a shame people having false beliefs. That's bad. But in this circumstance, it's for the general good. And when it ceases to be for the general good, well, you know, I'll wipe make sure wipe it out. Uh, to take me to the next step. Okay, the next step is this. What's really valuable is that people have opportunities for, for love, to be unselfish giving. And 
when you look around at the world, what you see is a very hard, a very unpleasant school for love. And so the sort of God who'd produce that would be a God who attaches enormous value to love, to people overcoming obstacles. What does that mean about God, though? What it means is that God values something more highly than our comfort and our pleasures and our lack of pain. And I think God values love. But now this is the, this is the, the speculative twist is that it doesn't just apply to us, it applies to God. If being loving is so valuable, why be the hard utilitarian? I mean, there's a, there's a, there's an... So uh, God changes. God changes. I mean, that's a big change. That's not like this little change in God's mind. I mean, this is like a big character change. Yeah. God becomes something loving. And that may involve... It's like a, it's like a conversion. Yes. God gets converted. Li- like that. And maybe that involves... You're the first guy to convert God. I'm impressed. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, so you start off with the idea of this impersonal God whom you wouldn't worship, who is really a god of the philosophers, a bit of a bastard, but God sees the wonderful world of hard love, tough love. And, but God also sees, is if love's such a wonderful thing to be, God becomes loving. And to do that, God limits him, her, them, selves, power. Because that requires limitation. Love requires kenosis, Kenosis meaning an emptying. Meaning empty. emptying of self. So God um, changes by turning from a cold kind of utilitarian God to a loving God. And God uh, takes on whatever limitation is required to be loving. That's the, the view in, in, in a nutshell. And among other things, it's meant to provide an emotionally satisfying response to the problem of evil. And because the God who set the world up with its propensity for evils was this cold sort of utilitarian God, the God who cares and would remove them if she, he could, is the God who is now limited in power the reason I think God is limited in power is I think God sets up laws of nature that are necessary in a rather strong sense and constrain all agents, including God. And that's permanent. And that's permanent, yes. And so this God, this utilitarian, neutrally moral God, at some point had to make this uh, eternal decision, if you will, to convert himself, itself, into a God that is loving, limited, and emptying. That's a, that's a big decision, bigger than any decisions I've made. Yeah, I'm proudly anthropomorphic because the only thing we have to understand God is ourselves. I think that we human beings, for our limitations, are the sort of most wonderful things there are in the world around us. And... Um, God's decision is like our decisions, just uh, greater in scale, on my view. I think in our, you know, on a good day, that is what we all do. Make decisions that, that limit ourselves for the sake of others. And I think God is doing the same kind of thing. I'm taken by Peter's developmental theology. By venturing to shake up our tradition-bound God, he expands our sense of what God may be like. While not for a moment do I believe developmental theology to be deeply true, I'm energized by Peter's innovation and insights. In playing the God game, it's good to be yanked out of comfort zones, my ingrained patterns disrupted because God, if there is a God, would be the ultimate ground of being. In seeking God, I travel opposite paths, explore conflicting concepts. On the one hand, I want to see all the alternative gods. On the other hand, I'm blinded by the blizzard. So I return to consider the traditional God, more knowledgeable perhaps, though feeling no wiser. Attending the workshop as a critic is the professor of divinity at Cambridge, theologian and Anglican priest, Sarah Cookley. 
Sarah, come in a hailstorm of different ideas about God. It used to be more binary, God exists or God doesn't exist. Now there are all these different concepts of pantheism, panentheism, uh, value, uh, deism. Does that advance us in, in our understanding? Well, the question I'd want to press you with is what do you expect of a notion of God? as opposed to, say, a notion of blip or blop. <laughs> you know, we can, we can sit back in our armchairs and have a fantastically exciting intellectual set of speculations about notions of that without which there wouldn't be nothing. But what really excites us as humans about God, it strikes to me, if we're properly to call this God, is some being that demands a transformation of our life. So if we had a belief in a blob who simply set the whole thing going but was fundamentally uninterested in us or maybe even malicious, this would not be a, a vision of a person who is calling us into some kind of transformation of perspective, of moral virtue. And I would want to ask you, would that satisfy you? Well. Uh there's a coherence in what you say, but yet I feel that's a second step. Mm -hmm. It's not a first step, because whether that satisfies me or whether uh, I, I, am, I am repelled by it is an emotional response. I don't want to have that. I, what I want to have is, is a reality. If the reality I like, I'll be happy. If I don't like, I'm going to adjust to it, because it's, it's, it's a reality. What you want is what is true. I want what is true. Mm. And I, I, I worry that if, if I have uh, affective uh, 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 responses to it, that I would begin to doubt whether that is true. Well, I, I see your point. You don't simply want um, a god made in your own image who will comfort you, right. who then becomes dispensable if you find a nicer one. <laughs> On the other hand, I think you're wrong to suggest that any decision about God can be made purely by ratiocination and not by effective response. All right, but let's, let's, so let's, let's go into the specifics pantheism, where God is the world and it seeks to deal with the problem of evil or deal with the integration of science in a more natural way, and panentheism, which uh, gives God greater space than pantheism in a way. Uh, uh. Well, I think you, what you need is a, is a checklist of what you might call existential or philosophical problems that you want solved by whatever God is going to um, satisfy you. But you also need a checklist of the criteria or conditions under which you would be swayed. So is the God whom you are likely to believe in one for whom the evidences seem the most convincing? Or is it uh, a notion that is logically compelling? Or is it the notion that is most coherent, takes account of the widest dimensions of, of uh, factors in your life and holds together? Or is it again a notion that is aesthetically attractive and pleasing. Yeah, okay. These were all criteria. And I, I think they're all mm -hmm. uh, all legitimate. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I just uh, would try to keep myself out of it as much as possible and try to judge it on its uh, its third person act, not, not on a second person or a first person level. Yes, I think that, maybe that's impossible. Well, I think that is actually ultimately impossible, <laughs> but I, I, I understand your legitimate desire to be as dispassionate as possible in the first instance. What I want to suggest is that it's extremely hard, absolutely, to abstract from practitional commitment when making these decisions. Um, in fact, I think it's ultimately foolish to try and do that because there is something about the integration of life commitments and questioning rational philosophical considerations that we search for in religious and philosophical questions. And those who claim that they're absolutely um, uncommitted emotionally to that which they argue always strike me as highly unconvincing. Sarah advises that God is found best by integrating the intellectual and the emotional. Intellectually, I agree. Emotionally, I resist. Emotion is a foundation to secure religious belief. I'm sorry, too wobbly for me. Wondering about God, I explore alternative gods. Have I made progress? Well, what is progress when wondering about God?
To me, progress is not belief, because belief might be self-delusion. And progress is not disbelief, because disbelief would leave too much unexplained. Progress to me is broader, deeper, richer understandings of what God, if there is a God, may be like, even if the existence of God is made no more likely. I consider pantheism. God is the cosmos and the cosmos is God. Developmental theism. God evolves, God grows better. But must God be defined in either traditional or alternative terms? Let all concepts of God compete, I say. Which, if any, do you think is closer to truth? For complete interviews and for further information, please visit closertotruth.com. This program was supported in part by a grant from the John Templeton Foundation.